Little Britches. Father and I were ranchers. Today we'll try and finish up chapter 31. After the services, Dr. Brown glanced at Mother's red streaked hand and said, Mrs. Moody, that is surgeon's blood poisoning. If you're ever to raise Charlie's children, you must come home with me at once. Everybody was shocked except Mother. She was a small woman and Dr. Brown was a very large man. She looked up into his face and said, Yes, doctor, I know. I believe I have no choice in the matter. All our neighbors, both from the ranch and from Littleton, pressed around, offering to take us youngsters in. Cousin Phil said something about riding our other relatives in New England. For just one moment, Mother's eyes flashed. Then she was calm again. No, Phil, I'm sure Charlie wants us all to be together. Then she parceled us out to near neighbors, being sure that Hal went where there was a good cow, that Muriel went to a motherly woman without too many youngsters of her own. At the end, she said to me, Son, I want you to stay with Laura Pease, where you will be near our home and can take care of Lady and the hens. Tomorrow you take Babe over to Mr. Hockaday and tell him Father would have wanted him to have her. He needs a good horse, and he's a fine, honest man. He'll pay us all she's worth. Then she thanked our neighbors and kissed us all around, leaving me till the last. I remember how my lip trembled, wondering if I were the least. She didn't cry until she put her hand on my head and said, You are my man now. I shall depend on you. Mother will be home in two weeks. It was not two weeks, but four. At the end of the first week, before Dr. Brown was sure he wouldn't have to amputate the arm, Mother sent for Grace and me. Grace had her 13th birthday two days after Father died. We harnessed Lady to the spring wagon and drove to Denver, stopping by the river to gather a bouquet of pussy willows. At Dr. Brown's big house on Capitol Hill, we were only allowed to see Mother for a few minutes. She was so thin we hardly knew her. Her eyes were deep in their sockets with black circles around them, and for the first time I noticed white in her hair. Her voice was very low, almost a whisper. She put her good hand out to us and smiled. Mother is going to be all right, she said. I've talked to the Lord a lot about it. He knows you need me. And with him and Dr. Brown, I shall be all right. Dr. Brown started to lead us from the room. When we had reached the door, Mother called me back. She took my hand and said, The peas should have been planted on St. Patrick's Day. You know where the seeds are in the barn loft. Soak them overnight and put plenty of hen manure deep in the trench. I don't know why that made me cry when I hadn't before. But from that moment, I was sure she was coming home. It was late in the afternoon of a pleasant mid-April day when they brought Mother home. Cousin Phil drove her out in his first automobile, a two-cylinder Buick with shiny brass rods to support the windshield. Dr. Brown and a nurse came with him. They carried Mother into the house and put her in a bed downstairs in the parlor. When I came in, she was saying to the nurse, I am perfectly all right now. All I need is my children. As quickly as I could get out, I harnessed Lady to the spring wagon and started the collection of brothers and sisters. Mother could be quite persuasive if necessary. She must have been so with Dr. Brown because just as we turned into the lane, the Buick was pulling away from our house. Dr. Brown and the nurse waved to us from the back seat as they went by. I was the last one into the house because I had to unhitch Lady. Most of the tears were shed before I got there, and Mother was propped up in bed, with Hal still sobbing and trying to bury his nose in her side. Her right hand was heavily bandaged. When I came in, she organized the first meeting of the clan of Moody. Now, let's not be sorry for ourselves anymore, she said. We've got lots of other things to do. First, we must get Mother's hand well. All it will take is good food and good care. I can't think of anything 
that would be better for it right now than a good chicken stew. Ralph, suppose you dress that big, fat, buff Opington hen that didn't lay last winter. Philip, you get Grace two or three armfuls of wood and some shavings so she can start a fire in the cook stove. And Muriel, do you think you could get the new tablecloth out of the dresser drawer and set us a table right here by my bed? When you get the fire going, Grace, put on the big iron pot with some fat in it so it will be good and hot when the hen is ready. And Hal... Would you get mother a drink of water? I can't think of a thing that would taste so good as a nice cool dipper of water right from our own well. The first supper was the most memorable meal of my life. The big yellow mixing bowl sat in the middle of the table, filled to the brim with well browned pieces of chicken, stewed until it was almost ready to fall off the bone, whole potatoes and carrots, with big puffy dumplings mixed at the bedside floating on top. Father had always said grace before meals, always the same 25 words, and the ritual was always the same. Mother would look around the table to see that everything was in readiness. Then she would nod to Father. That night, she nodded to me, and I became the man. And that's the end of the story. I hope you liked Little Britches. As Tigger says, ta-tas for now. Thank you so much for listening. Really do love you guys. Bye-bye.